All right, this morning we're going to continue looking at this series called Promises. And, and last week we were looking at the, the, right at the start of the Ten Commandments when God brought the Israelites to Mount Sinai and Moses is going up the mountain and God is speaking to Moses and about to give Moses the Ten Commandments. And we looked a little bit at that last week and we're going to look at a little bit more this week and see what God had to say to his people. But as we know, he had delivered his people from the hand of the Egyptians out of slavery. And he did not lead the Israelites into the wilderness to leave them on their own. He led them to Mount Sinai, a place where he would meet with them. And not just meet with them, but establish them as his people. And Mount Sinai was that place where, like I said just a minute ago, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were not meant to be just moral rules to live by. There is much more going on here, I think, than we think. I think there's something deeper going on here. And there's much more significance of the giving of the law and even the place where that law was given. And I think that significance carries over to us today in this 21st century. I mean, we're thousands of years removed from when that happened, but I think it still applies. Some of the things that are said here, some of the things that God said to Moses to tell the people of Israel, it still applies to us because we are God's people because of Jesus. You know, it's not an accident that Jesus, when he was on earth, one of his, the greatest sermon that he preached is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's no accident that he went up on a mountain to deliver a new way to live. Because Jesus was that new Moses, and he was speaking to God's people. So we're going to be in Exodus 19, verses, uh, we're going to start in verse 7. And the first thing we're going to look at is this idea of the great redemption. So as God has, has brought his people out of slavery, he has redeemed them. When we think of redemption, that word redemption means to, to pay for something you know, if you, if you have a, a gift card, you go to, this, to that place, that store, that gift card was issued at, and you redeem that gift card. You're paying a price for that. Jesus paid the price for us. He redeemed us. And so God is, is bringing the people to this mountain, to Mount Sinai, to remind them of what he did, to explain to them what exactly he did. He paid the price for them. He did everything. There was nothing the Israelites did to free themselves. Nothing. God sent the plagues, one plague after another, after another, after another. And then, and even before that, he sent Moses. Like, Moses, you go. You take Aaron with you. You go. And you talk to Pharaoh. And then after the plagues, when the Israelites left, God parted the Red Sea. Yeah, it might look like Moses, you know, with his staff, and he puts the staff down and the sea parts, but Moses didn't do that. God did that. God parted the Red Sea. And he came, then he brought the Red Sea to come crashing down on Pharaoh's army. So God has done everything, and he's bringing his people to the mountain to remind them of what he has done so that they can really understand what he had done for them. So in Exodus 19, starting in verse 7, reading through verse 9, this is what it says. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. When God brought Moses and the Israelites to the mountain, he wanted to establish right away that this was not a mutual standing relationship. And what that means is that the Israelites were not going to tell God what to do. It wasn't like God's bringing them to the mountain saying, all right, what do you guys want? God was bringing them to the mountain saying, this is what I'm going to say. Listen, listen. And the Israelites had seen the majesty of God on full display in Egypt. And the thing is, the Israelites had spent over 400 years in slavery to the Egyptians. And over those 400 years, the Israelites, I think more than likely were influenced by Egyptian culture. And maybe they were even worshiping some of the Egyptian gods, or at least sacrificing to them. I mean, 400 years is a very long time. God is not speaking to you. God has not done anything to you. So what are you going to do? You're going to kind of turn away. And you may think, well, why would they do that? Well, if you read 
a little bit further in Exodus when Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. And after he's gotten the Ten Commandments, he comes down to the mountain. He's only up on the mountain 40 days. And as soon as he starts walking down the mountain, what are they doing? They're worshiping a golden calf that Aaron made. So that was after 40 days. Imagine after 400 years what they were doing. So they might have been worshipped or at least acknowledged some of the Egyptian gods. And if they did, and they at least tolerated the gods of Egypt and knew about them. But God was not the gods of the, Egypt, of the Egyptian. He was not. You see, the gods of Egypt were statues. They were silent. They were powerless to do anything, especially powerless to do anything against the God of the Israelites. And God showed that. God showed that in very powerful ways. He's like, look, it's like Pharaoh, let my people go. Or else I'm going to do this. Pharaoh said, no, nah, you're not going to, whatever. I'm not going to listen to you. All right, then. And he would start one play and another. And as you notice, the place got progressively worse and worse and worse. And there was nothing Pharaoh could do about it. Even Pharaoh himself in Egyptian culture was seen as a god. Pharaoh himself was powerless to do anything against the God of the Israelites. Maybe over these generations, the Israelites had forgotten the God they had cried out for freedom. Or maybe they thought they could easily approach the God who set them free, but God wanted them to understand that there was a great separation between him and them. You see, God was revealing himself in a very powerful way on this mountain. If you go back to Exodus, I'm going to read another place here in just a second. In Exodus 19. Look at, look at verse 10. And he said, The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. He's saying, separate yourselves, concentrate yourself, get ready to meet with me. God was not messing around. He wanted the Israelites to know you can't just casually approach me. You can't handle me like maybe you did those Egyptian gods. I'm not a statue. I don't, I don't belong in a temple. I don't belong in a house. I don't belong made, overlaid with gold or bronze or silver or whatever it was. He said, I am God. If you skip down a little bit further, I'll look at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. And then look how the Israelites responded. Everyone in the camp trembled. I mean, I'm going to freak out. I'm sitting in this mountain and this cloud comes down and there is thunder and lightning. The whole place shakes. Heck yeah, I'm freaking out. I was like, this is, this is not normal. Who is this God? Even, the, even if you go and look at some of the Gospels, look at some of the things Jesus did. Remember that time Jesus fell asleep in the boat? You know, the disciples are rowing, the storm comes, and they're, they're rowing with all their might, and they're thinking they're going to drown, and Jesus is just taking a nap. And they wake him up, and they said, Don't you care that we're about to drown? And Jesus gets up and goes, be quiet. And the whole storm stops immediately. And the disciples are like, oh, we shouldn't have woke him up. <laughs> maybe, maybe like James is telling you, I told you not to wake him up. <laughs> I told you. See what happens? But they were afraid. And they said, who is this? That even the, the wind and the waves, the storms, Obey him. You see, God wanted to establish something at Mount Sinai here. He's like, I'm God who delivered you out of the Egyptians, out of slavery. I conquered their gods, and I will conquer all other gods, because I am the only one. God revealing himself in this way on the mountain was the start of Israel's great redemptive history. God was showing them just how powerless they were to save themselves. Knowing that there is a great separation between us and God, I think is vitally important to understanding salvation. It's, it's vitally important to understanding God's grace. 
If we don't understand just how far we are from God, then we will never understand the price God paid for us through Jesus. If you look at first, or 2 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25, this is what Peter writes. And I think Peter had to learn this over time. I think Peter had to learn just how powerful God is, how amazing God is. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. This is what Peter writes. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that has passed that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. And what Peter is trying to say is like, look, this is how we are by nature. We are always going to have a tendency to return to our own vomit. We're going to always have a tendency to wallow in the mud. We need to understand that there is a great separation between us and God. We don't compare to him. We need him. Without understanding how far away we are from God, we can't understand how big the price God paid for us through Jesus. See, God redeemed the people of Israel from the Egyptians. He redeemed them as their conquering king. He went to war against the Egyptians. When God acts, he is going to war. And it's not a war that he's going to you know, struggle to win. It's a war he's winning. And it's not really much of a war. He's going to fight. He's going to fight our enemies. God brought the Israelites to, the, to Mount Sinai to enter a covenant with them. He wanted to make his presence known to them in a big way to remind them that he was the God who brought them out of Egypt. And once he wanted them to understand that because he's like, look, I brought you out of Egypt and I'm going to take care of you. There's not, a, I'm, there's no threat to me. You see what I did to the Egyptians? Egypt was the empire. There were no other empires than Egypt was the main empire. They were powerful. You did not mess with Egypt. You could not conquer Egypt. You couldn't do anything against Egypt. And God made them look silly. He wasn't even threatened by them. He's like, if I can do that to the Egyptians, what do you think I'm going to do to anybody else that stands in the way? He was the God who put his power and majesty on full display to redeem them as a people. And now he was putting his power on display to let the Israelites know just who their redeemer was. If you look at Zephaniah, Zephaniah is an Old Testament prophet. Chapter 3, this is, what the, this is what this minor prophet says. Zephaniah is, is known as the, one of the minor prophets because the minor prophets, are they, they spent time prophesying to the people of Israel who are either in exile or about to be in exile. Look what it says in verse 14. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you and his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Think about that. Like, why did God send Jesus? Why did God send Jesus? So he could show us just how much he loves us. That's the powerful truth of Jesus, to show us just how much he loves us. Jesus is our conquering king. He came to conquer our enemies, which is sin and death. When Jesus was born, when he made those first cries on this earth as a baby, he was telling sin and death with those cries, your days are numbered. Your days are numbered. And when Jesus went to the cross, everybody thought we finally beat him. We finally defeated him. He's done. But when Jesus went to the cross, he's like, this is, what, this is how I wage war. This is my weapon of choice. You know, it's interesting that God, when he sent Moses to the Egyptian, and Moses is talking to God in the burning bush, and, and he's like, how are, they, how are, these, how are your people going to know that you sent me? 
He's like, you see that staff in your hand? Throw it down. Moses throw it down and it becomes a snake. You know, some, some Hebrew translations would even suggest that that may not have been a snake, but maybe a crocodile. It's interesting. Imagine that. Imagine throwing down your staff and a huge croc shows up. <laughs> and then the guy says, okay, pick it back up. And be like, no, I don't want to pick it back up. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's interesting that Moses goes to, quote, unquote, war, goes to battle with the Egyptians with a stick. With a stick. Jesus goes to war with a bigger stick. With the cross. Jesus came to pay the price in order to redeem us. And what does this redemption mean for us? What does it actually do for us? Well, it means that we are now adopted into God's family. And that's the second point this morning is the great adoption. When God was brought his people to Mount Sinai, he is announcing this great adoption. This great adoption. It's like, you are, my, you are no longer slaves now. You are free, but you're children. And you're my children. You're sons and daughters of the king, of the God of the universe. Go back to Exodus 19. And I read verse 10 just a little bit ago. I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to skip to, to chapter 20. Exodus 19, verse 10. And then I'm going to skip to chapter 20. And this is what God says. It says, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow have them wash their clothes. I just, I read that a little bit ago. I said, look, he's saying, separate yourselves, get ready. And then look at chapter 20. Chapter 20, starting in verse one, reading down through verse six. This is the first part of the 10 commandments. He says, and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. In the first two commands, he's saying, you, you should not have any other gods before me. And he said, don't make for yourself an idol. And then he goes on and explains, I'm going to take care of those who love me. I'm going to take care of you like a loving father would. God is announcing this adoption. You see, this covenant that God gave to Moses through the law was very similar to ancient Hittite covenants. The Hittites were an ancient people. They inhabited the promised land. And God listed them as those he was going to drive out before the Israelites so they could inhabit the promised land. Michael Williams writes in his book, Far as the Curse is Bound, he said, The Hittite king would offer to protect the people in exchange for their support and tribute. This was the only choice open to small, many small tribes that found themselves caught between larger powers. Such treaty relationships provided them a means of security in a world in which a small nation or tribe endured the continual threat of annihilation. See, the Israelites were caught. They always faced the constant threat of annihilation because they were small. And in comparison to the Egyptians, even though God defeated the Egyptians, the Egypt was still there, it was still a superpower. And then later on, when the Philistines rose up, Philistines were always a threat to the Israelites. And then you had the, the Assyrians who conquered them, the Babylonians who conquered them, the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans. They were always under constant threat of annihilation. But that is when the hero of the story swooped in to save the day. Anytime this nation would threaten them, God would always be there to swoop in. Because God defeated Pharaoh and saved the Israelites. He redeemed them. But he didn't redeem them just to enslave them again. He redeemed them to adopt them. This is very radical. This is not what you did. If a king conquered another nation, then those people belong to that king. And he could do whatever he wanted to with them. That's how the Israelites became enslaved in the first place. They were under the protection of Pharaoh at one time when Joseph was there back in Genesis. You know, Joseph in his colorful coat. But over time, a new Pharaoh took over 
And that Pharaoh looked and said, man, there's a lot of Israelites here. They're a threat to my kingdom. They will no longer be members of the kingdom. They will be slaves. But God did things differently. He, didn't con he doesn't conquer us to enslave us. He conquers us to adopt us. He conquers sin and death. He doesn't conquer us. He conquers sin and death to adopt us into his family. God was inviting Israel to be a part of his family. He was not treating them as defeated people. He was treating them as his sons and daughters. If you look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 through 23, this is where this comes from. And it's back at the beginning of Exodus. As God is talking to Moses and telling Moses what he wants him to do. He says this. When a leader sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the commands of the Lord his God, when he realizes his guilt. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading from Leviticus. I don't know why I said Leviticus. I put Exodus. Sorry about that. Verse 22. It says this. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. See that? This is before they even get to Mount Sinai. This is before the Ten Commandments. This is before they're even delivered. He said, this is what you're to do. You go to Pharaoh and say, you have my kids. And you're going to let them go or else. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, verse 23. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. God was not messing around. He's like, you have my kids. And when you threaten my kids, we're going to have problems. See, God called Israel his firstborn son, and he was not going to take no for an answer when it came to setting them free. When Jesus showed up, Israel, as well as those who were not of Israel, were God's sons and daughters. And Jesus wasn't taking no for an answer either. You see, sin and doubt said, no, nah, no, nah, Jesus, you can't have them. We have them. You can't do anything about it. And Jesus said, watch me. Watch me. Oh, you, oh you're going to put me on a cross? Go right ahead. I'll embrace it. Go right ahead. I'll go to the cross. You think that's going to end me? I don't think so. Oh, you're going to roll the stone over the tomb. Oh, I'm, I'm dead. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay, death, you have a hold of me. I get it. You think you won. Nope. Three days later, that stone's rolled away. You don't win. When God saved Israel from the Egyptians, he was adopting them as his own. He was showing them mercy because he wanted to show them mercy. If you look at Psalm 68, verses 5 through 6, this is a psalm of David. And David understood this idea of God adopting us as his own. And David writes this. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun scorched land. See what David, he said he's a fatherless, he's a father to the fatherless. He's a father who adopts. But here's the key to being adopted into God's family. It's faith. Notice how God told the Israelites to not make a carved image of any kind. God didn't even want them to make a carved image of what they thought he looked like. The reason being is because God wanted the Israelites to trust him in faith. Because the author of Hebrews defines faith and says it's, it's, it's the things that we hope for without, without seeing them. It's trusting in those things without seeing. God wanted the Israelites to trust in him without having to see him. Any image of God or any other God was strictly forbidden in the Jewish culture. God didn't want a cheap imitation of him. He wanted to show people the real thing. And that's why Paul writes to, about Jesus in Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God. You want to see what God looks like? Look to Jesus. You want to experience what God is like? Go hang out with Jesus. You want to understand how God loves? Go, go, go be loved by Jesus. You want to experience the fullness of God? Put your faith in Jesus. Jesus. 
That's why John writes in his gospel, he said, the word became flesh. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We are sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We are not born as sons of, and daughters of God through any effort of our own. We are born of God. When God brought the Israelites to Sinai, he was going through the adoption process. He was inviting them to enter his family by asking them to put their faith in him. He was setting up a guardian for them. That was the law. And I'm going to set up a guardian for you. I'm going to set up this thing to watch over you so you stay on the right path. Because I'm sending somebody else later who's going to fully redeem you. You just got to wait for him. But let's set up this guardian in place first. We are adopted not based on merit or social status. In fact, we are adopted into God's family despite our merit and our social status. Despite our merit and our social status. We are adopted despite how smart or talented we are. We are adopted despite how messed up we are. We are adopted despite being broken vessels. We are adopted despite being unwanted or unloved by the world around us. Like God doesn't go, well, how many followers you got on Instagram? Ooh, only 500? Well, that's not very good. I don't know if I can take you in. He doesn't do it. How many, how many friends you got on Facebook? Ugh, that's not a lot. You must not be very likable. <laughs> I'm not taking you in. I don't, I don't know if I want to spend eternity with you. He doesn't care. He doesn't see us and go, yeah, you really need to do something about those flaws you got. Those are pretty bad. He says, yeah, come on in. Let's go. But God, I got flaws. I got, bro I got cracks. I got, I got all this stuff messed up. I, I'm, I'm just messed up, Lord. If I walked into a church, the, the whole thing would fall down on top of us because of how bad I am. And you know what Jesus says? I don't care. Come on in anyway. Don't worry about the cracks. Don't worry about your mistakes. Don't worry about your flaws. We'll take care of those. Jesus just says, come to me in faith. We are adopted because God loves us. And he wants a big family. That's it. Think about that. God wants a big family. God wants to spend eternity with a bunch of sons and daughters. He wants to have great big feasts. You know, we, we read about that in scripture, the feast, the wedding feast of the lamb. God wants that table to be filled. And it's a big table. And he wants everybody to be, every seat to be full. We are adopted because of Jesus. In Colossians chapter three, verse three, this is what Paul writes to the Colossian church. He says this, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When you give your life to Jesus, your life is now hidden with Jesus. You know, we, we're like, we tend to be like our, our ancient parents, Adam and Eve. We tend to, to make fig leaves as coverings. And we said, oh, we got to hide. Let's go find a bush to hide in because we're so bad. We need to hide our shame. And God is going, quit trying to hide your shame and your guilt. Quit trying to hide your sin and give you life to Christ. And I'll hide you in him. Because, you know, those bushes aren't good enough. Jesus is. And when we're hidden with Christ in God, guess how God sees us? He sees us just like he sees Jesus. Without flaw, without blemish, without mistakes. He sees us as perfect. But you say, well, I still sin. I still make mistakes. Well, yeah, but that's not how God sees us. We define ourselves by our mistakes and our shortcomings. God defines us by Jesus because we are hidden in Christ. If you give your life to Jesus, believing in Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing he died on the cross, rose again from the dead, you are hidden with Christ in God. Amen. Amen. Amen.